What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Fantasy Files podcast, where we talk about our favorite fantasy series and topics. We are your co-hosts, Spencer and Gabe. And Gabe, what are we doing here today? So glad you asked, Spencer. Today we're chatting with Kelly McCullough about his career as an author and specifically about the Fallen Blade series. That's right. We're going to get into some great discussion with Kelly. We'll talk mostly spoiler free. And if we have time at the end, we might have a couple spoilery questions, but we'll give you fair warning before we start spoiling stuff. Before we get started, though, remember that subscribing and liking the video is a big help to us. And if you'd like to reach out and continue the conversation, our Twitter and Discord are linked in the description below. And speaking of things that are linked in the description, we also have our brand new Patreon page linked down there where you can support our monthly podcasting expenses and get your name shouted out on the show and get access to downloadable bookmarks, uh, episode topic voting privileges, and even exclusive content coming very soon. So go check that out if that interests you. And by the way, shout out to... Shad Zaman, who backed us at our Night Angel tier. Thank you so much for doing that. We really, really appreciate that. Uh, If there's any other new backers at the third tier or above by the time that this goes live, uh, I'll include a special shout out for you in editing at the end of the video. Um, But yeah, with all that business out of the way, let's introduce our guest, talk about his career a bit, and celebrate the fantastic series that is Fallen Blade. Uh, Kelly McCollo, thank you so much for joining us. I have been a, a big fan of the Fallen Blade series well before we started the podcast. Um, and it's it's kind of surreal to, to be talking to the guy who wrote it. So thank you for joining us. Hi, it's my pleasure. I uh, It is always a, a joy in my life to get a chance to talk about writing and uh, to chat with people who enjoy the work and just in general to to have fun with with the Fallen Blade series and where that's taken me and and the other books. So I guess for the people that may not have read the Fallen Blade series yet, do you want to talk a little bit about who you are and and what the Fallen Blade series is? Sure, absolutely. So um, I write stuff. Mostly I write novels. <laughs> mostly I write fantasy. But I you know I write a little bit of poetry. I write short stories. Um, I've written some science fiction stuff for uh, National Science Foundation, uh, did a graphic novel for NASA, um, but but fundamentally I'm mostly a fantasy writer and mostly a novelist. That's that's kind of where my, my, my core love falls. Um, one thing I always try and, and set up at the front end when I'm talking about things is, you know, there are a variety of types of writers. Some people are like, I, I follow my passion, I go where I love. I'm a word mercenary. <laughs> um, I, I'm like, there's a lot of stuff that I would love to write, you know, don't get, don't get me wrong. I love the art. I love the, the storytelling, but I have enough breadth of what interests me that a lot of what I do is like, oh, so what would you like me to like to pay me to write? And, and that's sort of where I go. Sure. Um, Fallen Blade is kind of a hybrid of, of labor of love and that mer- word mercenary thing. Mm-hmm. Um, sort of the log line that I pitch it with is uh, first century Chinese temple assassins. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a secondary world. It's not actually China. They're not entirely temple assassins, but that gives people right. the flavor. Um, so the sort of the world of Fallen Blade is something that I wrote a good chunk of in a novel called Assassin Mage, which is the second book I ever wrote. It's currently sitting in a trunk because it's not a great <laughs> book, but it has a lot of ideas that I love. So yeah. when I was finishing up Web Mage, which was my uh, techno fantasy humor novel with uh, Greek gods and magic as coding, and I was talking with my then my then editor, I'm like, okay, what do you want to do next? I'm 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 pretty much done with Web Mage. Let's let's find a new project that you're, you'd be interested in publishing. I'd be interested in writing. And we we had I'm like okay here's a bunch of sliders I'm happy to write anything that you're interested in, um, how how dark or light do you want it to be how funny do you want it to be, uh, hard science fiction at one end pure fantasy at the other, and so we went back and forth on kind of the tone of something we wanted to talk about and and the set, setting so we ended up with like something darker than Web Mage in a in a secondary world something high fantasy I'm like okay great let me go 
spend a couple of weeks thinking about this. I'll come back to you and pitch something thorough. And at that point, I'm like, okay, if I'm writing secondary world high fantasy, you know, it's not Lord of the Rings. It's it's something. Oh, and we wanted to talk about something more episodic, mm. something that wasn't like a, a hard, fast trilogy with those beats where you're telling one story over a series of books. Right. Um, one of the things we talked about was um, the Dresden Files, as sort of mm-hmm. a model. Yeah. Um, just in model. terms of <laughs> yeah, in terms of structure. And so I went away and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna pull this stuff out of this fantasy world that I love that I'm not gonna get to write. Um, and then how do I? How would I write that writing now as opposed to the ten years ago when I when I was thinking about it? I said, okay, uh, how about we do something? And this is again touching back on the Dresden Files, something much more episodic, much more detective, much more noir. So like Mickey Spillane and Mike Hammer and all of that stuff, in terms of tonality and in terms of story structure, so you can do beat, 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 beat. And so that's that's where I was when I was sort of creating the idea. And the the first version was like a couple of chapters and a pitch for the first three novels, and that had some of that that trilogy structure. Um, but more of the, the that that intermittent beat piece, and then book four ultimately ended up being what book three was in the original pitch because it sort of capped off that that first character arc from you know broken drunken detective hero back to something of a hero hero in the more fantasy classical mode. Right. Yeah. I I definitely picked that up because I I I reread uh, the first and I'm. I'm about halfway through the second book in the graphic audio right now. And I, uh, I picked that up this read through where I was thinking, Oh yeah, this really does feel like it has a noir element that I didn't quite remember from my, my first read throughs and him kind of, you know, sitting in the tavern at the beginning of that first book and kind of the femme fatale walks in and he's kind of narrating it in his head. I'm like, Oh yeah, this, this really has like a, a cool noir feel. But yeah, so how how did you guys kind of uh, kind of land on this world? Were you, did you guys kind of brainstorm this world together, you and your editor? It was more uh, my editor, my sort of my editor's input was, I want something that serves these purposes. So what she's lo- she was looking for was something fantasy, something in the more dark end. You know, she brought up the Brent Weeks books, um, mm-hmm. just uh, fantasy and assassins more generally, globally was what she was looking for. We had a really good relationship uh, in terms of she trusted me to say, okay, here's here's what I think I'm going to do. Here's what you said you want. Here's how I'm going to address that. And she's like, great, go go do that. I trust you to trust you get it done, um, which had a couple of funny moments over the course of the series. Uh, one of them was, so my first, first contract was for WebMage and a sequel. And I, I had a really good idea what the sequel was going to be. The second contract was, was for book three and four. And I had a really detailed outline about book three. This is what I want to do. And then I was like, okay, great. And I'm going to go, go do book four. I sat down to start writing it. And I looked at my my notes. And my notes were essentially, yeah, these are some problems that happen in fantasy. And I, I think we, you know, I can maybe address them by doing this. Trust me. <laughs> Which was not a lot to work with. Yeah. So yeah, the okay. the, the the Blade books was, it's pretty much all me in terms of the creative side of it and my editor in terms of what those creative needs needed to suit in terms of marketing and um the kind of things that she thought would be selling at the time gotcha okay nice okay cool my other kind of intro question here is you know fallen blade it it tackles a lot of um really kind of deep and and cool themes like uh like loss and kind of refinding your purpose in life and you know addiction and stuff like that um what is it about fallen blade what what does that mean to you as an author in comparison with your other works do you have any specific um i guess kind of attachment or nostalgia for the series yourself there are a couple of things that I, I I love about it. So one of the things that I I set out to do every time I'm I'm writing a book or writing a series is I'm like, okay, I want to try and tackle something that I'm not sure that I I want my I want my reach to exceed my grasp. I want to mm. say, you know, can I do this? And so with Errol, um, you know, 
Farrell's an alcoholic. He's a former religious fanatic. Um, he had this 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 deep belief structure, and none of that is who I am. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, a quintessential uh, materialist atheist. I'm I'm pretty grounded in reality. I'm not I'm not that particularly honesty. So I wanted to approach someone who's very different than mm-hmm. I am. Yeah, the sort of big picture on the series. Uh, one of the things that I I love about writing fantasy. One of the things just that is my the core of it is you can talk about sort of the big picture stuff. You can talk about love. You can talk about loyalty. You can talk about honor. You can you can approach ethics, and you can do it in a way that even if you might be cynical tonally, mm-hmm. you can do it in a way that you can't in like mainstream fiction. These yeah. are things that readers and, and I think people in general care about. Yeah. Um, but the way our cultural works, it's it's often hard to address that. So one of the things yeah. that I love about writing the Blade books is it gets me the chance to do that. But also, I there's there's stuff that I wanted to do that cuts against sort of the the core core ideas of fantasy. So you know, the one true king, the chosen one, mm-hmm. um, hello kitten. Uh, I will have a cat in my lap here. I think mm-hmm. in a moment. Um, <laughs> one of the things that cuts against is you know that that one true chosen thing, the king. I, I wanted to examine the idea of faith and belief and gods in a world where they actually exist, where they're mm-hmm. provably yeah. demonstrably real. Right. Um, and how does that affect sort of the dialogue with higher powers? And one of the other things I wanted to really look at in depth was, um, you know, democracy versus monarchy, aristocracy versus meritocracy. And so there, those are a huge part of the bigger nine book arc that I, I think I was about a halfway through the first book. Um, I, the first book was bought with the plan of buying three. Oh. <laughs> um, Good kitty. But yeah, so the first, the first book was, was written knowing there were going to be three and about half to a third, a third to half of the way through that first book, I started thinking about all of the themes and where I wanted to take them and ended up with, what is essentially a nine book arc and so the first six were published by ace um i recently finished uh book seven as part of my patreon um and i'm working on book eight and and looking forward to book nine and it's been really a lot of fun to get back to that that arc and that that world nice that's cool did uh, did you ever take a break for a while like took a chunk of time where you just didn't quite write or, or really think about it or have you just been always planning like it six kinda... and seven yeah well there's a yeah there's a big gap between books six and seven so the first six books happened pretty much on a yearly basis with my mm. publisher case um and then random house bought out penguin uh putnam and that had a deleterious effect on my <laughs> the adult side of my fantasy career um so I was I was not working in that general space at all for a while. I was doing uh, mm-hmm. middle grade books, and I, I did three for uh, Fywell Macmillan, um, and I love those books too. But and then I've been also in a, recently I've been in a transition from my agent of twenty years. I just mm-hmm. in the last month signed with a new agent, so I'm mm-hmm. oh that's right yeah that, that whole restructuring career thing at the moment yeah part of that was I started the Patreon. Oh God, it must be two and a half years ago now. Mm-hmm. And I knew that I had core fans for, for various series, but the core fans for the Fallen Blade series are probably there there are more of them than they're harder core fans than <laughs> than most of my web mage fans. So I'm like, okay, yeah. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna start a Patreon. I'm not really particularly worried about how much money it makes yeah. right at the moment, but I'm gonna start a Patreon to get me writing again mm-hmm. in that space. And so I've been very slowly I very slowly worked through the first of that that final trilogy of of fallen blade books and i've been working towards getting all mine done um so yeah there was about a i think a, there's a three or four year gap between the end of me running six and the beginning of me running seven gotcha. okay what was it hard to get back into the world going into seven after that break or did it feel kind of like slipping on an old pair of shoes it was it was a mix so part yeah. of it is um i try to write i try to create a narrative voice for each series rather than work from a a narrative voice that is me Mm -hmm. 
So there's a specific narrative voice with the Blade books that is very different than the way the, the narrative voice of the Web Mage books. So I actually sat down when I knew I was going to start again, and I I listened to the to the uh, graphic audios of all mm -hmm. six books a couple of times, and I reread the I reread them as well mm. in the service of getting back in that space. Right. Um, Errol is a pretty solid person in my head, and so are most of the other characters. So once I had that the time to sort of reground myself in the in the narrative voice space, all of the characters were already there. It's pretty easy to pop back into that. But the hmm. but making sure that the voice is consistent with the previous books was was where yeah. I focused a lot of work. Awesome. Okay, cool. Well, I want to go back to something you you touched on, uh, something that I I very much appreciate about the Fallen Blade series. You talked about how you know when you're when you're dealing with fantasy, when you're writing fantasy, you get to tackle all these really difficult topics in, uh, I, I don't want to say an easier way, but you have more room to kind of explore them in a fantasy world with, with some of these characters. Um, and one of the things that I really, really appreciate about the Fallen Blade series and why it's so uh, like nostalgic and like personal to me is uh, Errol's alcoholism and his uh, drug addiction with the ethic and all that. Um, and I, I can't remember if you and I talked about this a little bit on on Twitter a while back and our our listeners know this, so this won't be breaking news or anything. But I started reading the Fallen Blade series when it was at the beginning of a year long process of getting clean from heroin. And so I, I read I read the series twice over that year. And it was so nice because, you know, during that time, I was like in and out of rehab and like I would get clean for, you know, a couple months here and then I'd stumble and, and go back and get clean for another couple months and kind of go back and forth. And, you know, when you relapse and stuff, it you feel like just the worst piece of shit ever. Like you like you judge yourself so hard for it. And as I was going through that whole process, I'm reading about Errol and he's kind of, you know, I'm, you know, I can't identify with his assassinations, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, he's going through a similar thing where when we first meet him, he is, uh, he is kind of recovered from being an ethic addict and he's now an alcoholic and he's got this best friend who's always with him, Tris, and he's always trying to like, encourage him and we see Errol kind of like start to get better and slide and start to get better and slide and you know during so during that time where where I was trying to get clean um it was so encouraging to you know e even though it's like a fictional character you know it's it was so encouraging to have this character that was kind of alongside me that was also like it, it was you know kind of teach me that okay like I, I can get back up and it was it was encouraging so Anyways, I don't want to get like too sappy or anything, but I did <laughs> want to say like thank you so much for that for that character because that was such a uh, encouragement in that time. I that very touched, very for <laughs> Clint. That, I mean, so I'm I'm not myself a terribly addictive personality, but I have a number of friends over the years who have struggled with addictions of various kinds. Mm. And one of the things that was really, really important to me when I was writing these books was to try and... So one of the things that we do in fantasy that bothers me is, you know, you have this huge problem and you're rolling along with it and suddenly, magically, there's an epiphany and it's all over. <laughs> yeah. And that's not the way human beings no. work mm -hmm. so one of the things that i really wanted to do with these books and i and i want to do going forward um because part of of the book seven arc is is about errol's continuing struggles it's it's less of a space in, in book eight but it's, it's always there in the background yeah yeah is is to be honest to that to be honest to the idea that yeah we fall down and ideally we pick ourselves up Maybe we don't do it this week. Maybe we don't do it tomorrow. Maybe right. it takes a month. Maybe it takes us a year. But I really wanted that to be an ongoing part of Errol's issues. Yeah. Um, ironically, uh, perhaps, well, not, not ironically, that's taking some of the, the weight out of it. So 
I come out of theater and dance, so I have uh, some dysmorphia issues. I have, I don't necessarily see myself as I am, and and that has led to some borderline eating disorder issues. Anyway, some years ago, in in one of my online forums, I was chatting back and forth with somebody who was in their process of losing weight, and her entire mantra is just for today mm-hmm. just for today i'm not going to have a second helping just for today i'm not going to have a dessert and that informs the errol stuff where it's like okay i may fuck up tomorrow but if i get it right today i've gotten it right for today yes yeah absolutely yeah de- definitely i and i i love that i love that uh throughout as you know it's been a while since i've read through the entire uh all all of the first six books but from what i can remember it's a struggle all throughout all those six books he's kind of going back and forth and that that was something i really appreciated because it's like you know there was some books where he was doing significantly better and some books where he wasn't and uh i guess you know very light spoilers there's even some stuff with like epic later on in the books which i thought was really cool and it was interesting because i i feel like it would be really tempting for an author in the first book to have him have this struggle and then at the end of that book uh and and we even kind of see it at the end of the first book he's like i'm i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna do it sober and it's kind of like he's leaving on that high note and then in the second book we see him going back to going back to like whiskey and stuff and it's real like that's yeah he's not just gonna say like oh i'm never gonna do this again and then never do it again he's gonna have struggles throughout the whole thing and so i i really i really appreciated that portrayal of that uh and kind of his thoughts around it and then also having tris there who's yeah. kind of an encouragement throughout all of that like because tris loves him no matter what like there is nothing that errol could do well may i don't know that for sure but i i would imagine <laughs> there's nothing that errol could do that would make tris like completely disown him but he does have that that firm hand in Triss where Triss is like, no, we've got to do better about this. We've got to get back on, you know, the right path, but it's also encouraging. Like, I know you can do this. And like, you're a good person, Errol and and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I thought, I thought that relationship, that relationship with Triss was really, really cool regarding that. Uh, But also just regarding the rest of the series, Triss is such an awesome companion. Yes. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) One of my sort of signature author things, one of the things uh, that editors pay me for is that companion, that permanent companion. So I was going to ask, I was going to ask you about that exact thing. So I'm glad you're going there. <laughs> <laughs> so with Web Mage, the, my lead character is a, he's a magical hacker and he's a child of the Greek. He's a grand, great grandchild of the Greek fakes. And he is constantly back and forth and the sort of the core relationship for him is his familiar who he is a both a piece of code and a physical object. So mm. um, Melchior is a goblin sometimes, and he shape changes back and forth to a laptop. But he's he is tied to the lead character in, in a variety of ways, and their interaction is is an ongoing piece of it. And theirs is a very very snarky relationship. Um, of all the characters I've ever written, Melchior the um, wise ass goblin companion is probably the one that is closest to me closest to my own personality <laughs> <laughs> i am much less the hero in that movie. um with with errol and tris i was trying to replicate some of that that bound by love but tris is you know he's he is your conscience externalized he's yeah. also your permanent permanent rolling intervention mm. yeah um, he, he's his own person as well and one of the things that i one of the reasons I created Triss the way that I did is that in addition to that part of it, um, Triss has a, Triss, sorry, Triss has a completely alien Mm -hmm. um, morality structure. Mm -hmm. And I can have these conversations about, you know, maybe there, there are people that need killing. Maybe there aren't. I, I try not to make it, you know, Errol has a very express opinion. Triss has a very express opinion I have a lot of conflict over the entire issue myself, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but I, it allows me to have that conversation about 
how do we address genuine evil? Yeah, yeah. Um, I I don't sort of personally have a an externalized. There is an externalized evil. I'm. What are our actions? Are our actions evil or good? Mm-hmm. And nobody is one pure thing. So, a lot of the interplay in the in the blade books is between the necessary actions to make a society work and the moral and ethical underpinnings of that. I was I was yeah I tweeted the other day something that is kind of my my quintessential beat structure as an author, which is ooh, this I, I, I haven't had an action sequence in, in a while. I need to have a, a really intense action sequence. I need to bring up the stakes. I need to move things along. I need to and I'll have that and about the time I'm finishing up that scene, I'm like, you know, it's been a really long time since I've had a long, abstruse intellectual discussion about mm. the morality of being an assassin. And I'll go yeah. off and do that, or the underlying magical structures. And that's kind of yeah. the way I think about fiction is 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 the tension between the thinky bits and the action sequences that make it all move. Yeah. Yeah, I... I really love that about this the series, those kind of like intellectual kind of philosophical bits. Um, I, From what I remember, there a lot of them kind of happened later in the series, but we even see a little bit of it in the in the first book. But this whole I, I love this whole kind of through line through the series, I guess, where Errol, he loves his goddess so much and he loved and he was so good at his work he says over and over like i he's like you you guys really have no idea like how good i was at this thing and you know you can tell that he was like a part of this community and he was the best at it and like he loved his goddess more than anybody else and then she died and what the goddess did what namara did was it she gave him purpose in that he knows that if she says somebody needs to die they need to die and the the blame i guess is kind of off his shoulders right and so it, it kind of gets addressed later on where he's kind of like you know i i wish that i had that i wish that i had now i wish that i had somebody that could point me in a direction and say kill and i would do it and i wouldn't have to worry about the morality of it because i would just be obeying orders um and then later on it also kind of does kind of get addressed on did namara always know if if she was sending out the correct orders like did, did she always 100 percent know that somebody needed to die uh and so i i love that whole inner conflict because you could feel at times it was like tearing him apart where he wanted to kill because he's really, really good at it. And he knows that he can make the better or make the world a better place through doing that. But at the same time, he doesn't want to be responsible for making the decision. Um, and, you know, we, we see him come make, kind of come to terms with that later on. But yeah, I, I love that whole through line. Yeah. So one of the, the one of the books, there's there's a moment where I was running through my writer's group and my writer's like, wait a second, Errol's a sociopath. And I'm like, no. No, Errol is an empathetic psychopath. <laughs> um, and that's, I mean, that's, that's his foundational. Yeah. Role. Wow. Yeah. He's a psychopathic. He, he, he's a psychopath, he, but he's a psychopath for the forces of good. Right. And he has enough self-awareness and enough inner conscience to understand that. Mm-hmm. So a huge part of his conflict and the the sort of the the inner conflict of of all of the major characters in the book is that constant un- un- am I a monster? Do we need monsters? Mm, mm-hmm. How how do I address that? How do I move forward knowing what I am, and how do I figure out the way to navigate that? So that's just part of almost everybody in the series is yeah. in terms of conflicts because they're you know the. They're they're the the characters who are not directly part of the Blade Order, but all of the folks who are in the Blade Order have that on some level. Yeah. So so here's a question, and I guess this kind of touches on on what we were just talking about. And if it's too similar to what we were just talking about, we can pass by it. But when you were creating Errol and Triss, did you have an idea of where you wanted them to go and what kind of lessons you wanted them to learn? You know, where where did those characters specifically kind of come from in your mind i don't know that i had a a huge picture of the personal arc 
Mm. Um, I, I feel that I'm a pretty good writer of character, but that's not the, that's sort of not my motivational space as an author. Sure. Uh, one of the things that, that, you know, if you talk to writers a lot, you'll, they'll thought you'll end up talking to people and they'll be like, well, are you a character author or a plot author? Mm -hmm. And I'm not really either one of those. I'm world driven. Mm -hmm. So when I was starting this out, I had, this is the world I've created. This is the magic system I've created. This is how the familiar stuff works. I want to write a story that will give me the chance to look through the whole panoply of the world. Mm -hmm. And, and, so, and in order to do that, you have to be a pretty good plot author. And so I built the, you know, I built that first three book arc, uh, which was very episodic and then book four is it's really a, a tetralogy yeah tetralogy would be the way to frame it with the first and fourth books being the the sort of the the big main character arc but when i'm writing i'm like book one arc each book has its own arc there's a the book the three book first arc there's the four book arc mm -hmm. but also i ended up with like Ferran, who is uh, becomes Errol's apprentice. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote her in with the intention she would be there in the first book, and there would be some stuff in the second. Yeah, sorry, she'd come be there in the second book. There'd be some stuff in the third book, and I I hadn't expected her to take such a huge role. Mm -hmm. But once I started writing her, I'm like, oh, this voice, this person, just like, no, I I'm taking up more space in the story. Get over it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> with that. Yep. She um, is so much fun. I I absolutely loved. I loved her arc. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Ferran is Ferran is a delight for me, and she's such a contrast to Errol because she's foundationally she's just not conflicted. There's, yeah, she has her conflict, but she's like, well, of course you need to kill people. What? Right? Why are we arguing <laughs> about what, why? Why is this even a topic topic of yeah. conversation? Yeah. She, she's like uh she's like super psychotic and the the great interplay between Errol and her is because like what what a great apprenticeship with her not having really this moral compass like at all Errol's kind of come in and be like no this is why we do it and like she wasn't um correct me if I'm wrong because I'm trying to remember she she wasn't uh she didn't really get to know Namera right Right. So she, I think she's nine when the goddess is killed. Right. Either. Okay. So like Errol is trying to pass down all these things that he learned from the island and from Namera and from his teachers uh, because she really like she had learned to like like how to kill people and stuff, but she didn't know a lot of the, the other lessons from from what I remember. Um, and so I always thought that was a really great relationship. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty good framing of it. And, you know, part of her arc, and, it, and it's ongoing, and it will continue through the whole nine book arc, is the, mm -hmm. oh, maybe a conscience is a thing I need develop, to develop. Mm -hmm. How do I go about doing that? <laughs> right. So I, I have another question here. What's, uh, I, I guess, I, I haven't read the seventh one, so we'll we'll stick to the first six. What's your favorite book in the series? That's always a tough one for me. Yeah. Um, I adore three crossed blades which is the first place where you get to see uh, a lot of interaction with some of the folks that uh are believed dead right let's, let's mm -hmm. with that. and it's 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 it, it's bringing a lot of the old conflicts that were there up to the surface yeah uh, and i feel i feel it's where this the series really hits its stride um i love broken blade i love bared blade i like what i did mm -hmm. with them I would do some things differently if I were going back to them now. Yeah. Um, but Crossblades, I feel, is like where it really hits the hits hits its beat. Yeah. Um, I love that. I love uh, I love book five, which is the the book where we we go and we see some of the um, the more alien denizens of this world. And that's mm -hmm. um, you know, I started out with my shorthand. We'll just call it shorthand because it's you know, there's a lot of stuff that I do. When I'm when I'm laying out a story, plotting it out, that's very shorthandy that I know isn't going to stick. So you know, I have I and when I had this, we're like, like, yeah, we have your elves and your dwarves and your you know your mer people and all of those things I know exist, but I'm not writing about them right now. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fill in the lines on that. Right. But that that book five is where we go essentially into fairy. You know, we cross the line into fairy and we see 
I got to play with a bunch of those things that that and I had in particular I had that part of the world pretty sketched out. There is a oh, I think three quarters of a novel um that's sitting on my hard drive that I want to come back to at some point, which is the two lead and I'm just I'm I'm shorthanding because they're not really elves in a mm-hmm. lot of ways. But the two lead elves that you see in in book five, I have a novel that is their story, and it's oh, about okay. a third, third written. Um, cool. And it was a delight to me to get to go back to those characters, which I had built, I don't know, twenty five years ago now. Okay, um, so I'm I'm trying to remember is book five, and I'm not going to spoil anything, but is book five the one where Errol? He's like in a cavern underground. There's like a pool of water, and there's a uh, my remembering this correctly at all oh my gosh maybe uh, yeah, i'm not there, yeah there's definitely a, there's a cavern and there's a waterfall and there's some yes. underwater stuff yep yep and yep city of wall oh five is the one with the big with the wall city uh yeah is that five, for... you see it in in a couple of places in five and then book six also starts there oh, okay so maybe it maybe it is book five that's my favorite because whichever one um the the city that he goes to that's just like the giant wall that's kind of snaking through the wasteland when he when he first gets there um you you mentioned some people that we that we thought were dead that may be alive uh the the person that he meets there uh just that reveal was so good um but yeah i i love that whole city fascinated me with the the two walls and it's it's just wide enough for like a small house on either side and like one street that runs through the middle. And I I just remember reading that and my imagination just running wild with with what that would look like. Um, and I, I actually had a question for you. Do you do you know about this thing in Saudi Arabia called the line? If if you have the ability right now i would do a quick just type in the line saudi arabia it is literally that city it's literally two walls and it runs in a straight line for miles and miles and miles and there's a city inside it um and as soon See, as I'm, I, I'm looking at it right now and it's freaking wicked isn't it so it's cool crazy dude <laughs> I, I think there's only like mock-ups and stuff right they now call it, but... they call it a linear smart city yeah whoa um, I'm 100 like, miles long. Yeah. Holy moly. Okay. I'm, I'm like, that's... I can come back to that. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm like, that's Kelly's city. Like, that's literally what he wrote. <laughs> I thought that was so cool. <laughs> literally bringing it to life. Yeah, so the, the, the antecedents for that for me were, um, you know, part of it is just it, it having this giant physical award around fairy was part of it. And part of it was, um, so Neil Gaiman's a friend. And... Oh. One of the things that I, I, one of the things in his work that just has stayed with me is, is the village of Wall in Stardust. I, I had created the, that ward in the Wall years and years, years before I met Neil. But the idea of this physical wall between our world and fairy fascinated me a lot. And reading Stardust, I'm like, oh, yeah, there would be this weird market space in the in the interstitial space between. Humanity oh, yeah. and so that that certainly informed the the rough ideas that I had when I was refining them. Sadly, I, I haven't read uh, I think any Neil Gaiman yet, <laughs> and I, I need to fix that. I need to read. Uh, I'll start with a. Uh, I'll start with Stardust. <laughs> yeah, you might also. Uh, um, trying to think of the name of his. I'll, I'll, it'll come back to me. But there's his his. Uh, his book that was based on the sort of the mini series that he had also that he was also involved at with with the with the portal character. Also, it'll come back to me. I don't know. Oh. It's an urban fantasy, and it's and it's this very interesting uh, liminal space where he's dealing with magic and the underground in London, and it's just it's a fab- fabulous, fun, dark book. Um. All right. Well, do we want to talk about? I I thought it was interesting, and I always think about this with like grim dark books or anything that has to do with um assassination and stuff like that because a lot of a lot of authors that write assassination are really good at describing how a character will you know jump from handhold to handhold and there's a lot of like really specific terminology and a lot of really like specific movements and I, I think it's funny that you know authors often joke about 
like, oh, my Google search history is filled with all this weird stuff that I had to research for my book and all, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there anything like funny or interesting that that you researched for Fallen Blade? How to murder somebody? Or... <laughs> uh, less for Fallen Blade because it's secondary world, but I know like any I've spent any you know amount of time on improvised munitions, how to get rid of a body, right? Uh, <laughs> and there there are all of these search terms that you're like, I I, I really hope nobody's looking. At this. Yeah, you're like <laughs> I hope I don't get flagged because. <laughs> So as it turns out, a friend of mine who's 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 another who's an author, uh, Lauren Gilman, who does some great fantasy work and just a variety of stuff. Um, she used to be an editor out in New York, and she I, I'm pretty sure it was Lauren who was like, "Yeah, no, I was talking to a friend who worked for the FBI, and they're like, oh, don't worry about it. We actually have a specific code for authors.'" Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So we have, we know, we, we know that you exist. Um, wow there's a, there's a there's you know we we you know we do this we do do our monitoring in an entirely legal way yeah um and and there's there's a oh this is an interesting search history oh it's an author and we just flag it that way and then oh. nobody particularly worries <laughs> about it again interesting now, oh that's I, awesome I, I don't know, you know, this is second hand. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but my understanding is that they that yes, the our our security apparatus is like, yeah, authors exist. They 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 search for a bunch of stuff that we do not want people broadly searching for. But, <laughs> but bringing them in isn't going to do us any good. We'll have a right. conversation like, "Oh. Yeah, you write mystery. Go away." Yep. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's that's super funny. It makes sense though that there would be some sort of some sort of code so that you wouldn't keep coming up in their system. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do uh let's do one more question and take a quick uh, bathroom break if you guys don't mind. Sure. Yep, don't mind. <clears throat> Errol enjoys uh, Kyle's whiskey, um, and I'm curious: are you a cut or a, are you a whiskey guy? Um, if so, what kind do you like? And does Kyle's whiskey have any like real life counterparts? Uh, so yeah, I'm definitely a whiskey guy. Um, I didn't actually start uh, drinking at all really until my 30s. And I started out with very, very sweet drinks. But as it turns out, um, I don't know whether it's <laughs> the Irish Scottish antecedents or what, over a fairly short time to, you know, dry, peaty, smoky kinds of flavors. So yeah, I'm definitely a whiskey guy. I've got a proposal that at at some point I hope somebody buys to write a basically a, it's currently I think outlined as a six book series on on uh, alcohol magic and um, oh. I love the idea. I think it would be a lot of fun and um, being able to call all of that research would be fabulous. Yeah, I mean, uh -huh. I mean, because yeah. uh -huh. it would honestly be comfortable with that and also. Okay, so uh, book three is a rum book. I need to go spend, you know, two months wandering around the Caribbean going to rum distilleries. Great. <laughs> yeah. This sounds like a good plan. Yeah, that's I great. Think this is a life, <laughs> life direction. Um, so I don't really have a a strong association for, for the Kyles, but the Kyles is definitely intended to be um, scotch whiskey and not bourbon. I, you oh, know, okay. I, drink, I drink scotch whiskey. I drink Irish. Um. I generally drink in moderation, but I, I drink fairly fancy in moderation. Yeah. So, I mean, if the Kyle's is anything, um, it's probably Macallan, maybe. Okay, or, yeah. But just something in that range where it's it's not real peaty, it's not real smoky, but it has those those flavors to it. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I always loved, I always loved the depiction of of Kyle's and uh you know Errol is like yeah this is like this is like top shelf stuff like I he's like I don't get like the he's like the other stuff will make you really sick and and whatnot and you you know you, he even says like you always want the I think I think it was in the first book that we just read where he's like you always want the bottle sealed you never want it to yep. uh, mm -hmm. to to get an open bottle from these places because you never know what they're going to put in it yeah. um but yeah I, yeah, I always I always thought the Kyles was funny because it's like a staple throughout the entire series. Just a, a quick note on the, the the sealed bottle. That was a so a friend of mine is a, he's a he's a marine biologist by training. He does uh, 
I think these days he's doing um, review of possible toxic dispersion. Mm -hmm. But when he was in graduate school, he spent a summer on a Russian research book. His professor was like, you know, you're an adult. You're going to go do re your research stuff. You're going to drink too much because you're hanging out with Russians. Yeah. I, I only have one thing that I want you to adhere to. Do not ever drink vodka from a bottle that comes to you open. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, and that's because, you know, they have methanol contamination in some of their ethanol. Yeah. And that'll kill you. Yeah. yeah. So that beat, that look, you know, go drink yourself insensible, go do the thing with the Russians. That's great. Yeah. You need to do it for your research. But do not drink from an from yeah. an open bottle it comes from that. Oh, wow. interesting. That's cool. So he'd have to like he'd have to buy his own bottle that's sealed and that would just be like his for the night because he knew it was safe. Or just watch yeah. him like unseal it. Like I know this yeah. was just opened. Part right. of Either one of those, but check the seal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. So I, I, I went and I took a quick look at my notes um, mm -hmm. on yeah. Kyle Whiskey. So I'm like, I, 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 I seem to remember, right? So the, there is a, a distillery in the Orkney Islands and it's Scapa. Okay. And the, the Kyle's is probably in my head uh, closest to Scapa because the man, the Scapa, the Scapa whiskey is, I've had stuff that's comparable, mm -hmm. but nothing that's as good at the admittedly stupidly high but reasonable by Scotch standards price point. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll have to write that down. Scaffold. Yeah, so I just I just put it in my notes. Yeah, so they the, the distillery operated for many years. They closed up shop. They reopened, and I think they're starting to, like, they've now been open long enough that they're starting to reissue their 12s. And, oh, man. Okay. Really good. Okay, I'll, I'll have to I'll have to check that out. I, I do like... Uh, like higher end whiskey. I got into whiskey uh, maybe a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, usually on the podcast, like on a Sunday or something, I'll have like my my glass of whiskey for the week. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I just like, uh, I don't know. I, it's been kind of a fun journey just trying like random, like higher priced whiskeys. Um, I think a couple of years ago, Gabe got me um, some some version of the Maker's Mark 46 that I really like. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then I, I like Woodenville bourbon. Um, I like Woodford Reserve, but I think by far my favorite, uh, and this is kind of like what I pictured Kyle's being is Angel's Envy. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so I, I love, I love Angel's Envy. Uh, I love like Basil Hayden. Yep. Yeah. And Angel's Envy is probably in terms of bourbons, it's probably, uh, closest to the sort of the scappa end where it's that. Okay. It has character, uh -huh. but it's light at the same time. I'm I'm mm -hmm. much more sweet. Light. You know, there there are times when like a glass of Lafroig or Lagavulin, where it's that smoke is like, oh man, I I really want to I really want a glass of Lafroig. I really it's like drinking smoke. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I will have a glass, and that first sip is like, oh yeah, that's exactly what I want. Like my second right. glass, second sip is not second glass. Second sip is like, yeah, this this, this really tastes like smoke. And about my fourth. <laughs> Why am I drinking smoke? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, I, I I really like bourbons that are just like, man, like I could just kind of sip on this for all night, you know, like just kind of really lightweight. Like the, that's why I really like the Woodenville bourbon. It's really, it's really light. It doesn't feel like it's drying you out from the inside, like immediately. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that's, that's really, that's kind of my go-to whenever I, you know just want like a 35 dollar bottle or something i'll just get like a wooden woodenville bourbon yep. um but yeah angel's envy too man like that i i tried that for the first time i think six months ago i, I was at like a bourbon tasting thing where they give you like six flutes and you could try them and uh one of them was the angel's envy i'm like oh man whenever when whenever I do have the money for you know a more expensive bottle, I will definitely get Angel's Envy because uh, I think I think it's like um, at at the store near me, it's like a seventy dollar bottle if I remember correctly. Yeah, if 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 you have a Costco around you, they get they get it in sometimes. 
a little okay. bit cheaper. It's something between fifty and eighty-five, depending on where you're buying it for the Angels Envy. Okay, nice. I was in Costco the other day, and I can't remember the brand of bourbon or whiskey, scotch, whatever it was, uh, but it was like it was like fourteen hundred dollars. They had it in a glass case. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, that might have been the Highland Park. Could could uh, be for sure, but it was like there was a fourteen hundred dollar bottle, a seven hundred dollar bottle, and a four hundred dollar bottle just in this glass, you know, like shatterproof wow. case up on the wall by the whiskeys, and I was like, holy crap, dude! And I'm sure there's way more expensive whiskeys, but yeah. just you know, you know, yeah. seeing seeing that and then seeing like the eighty top shelf eighty dollar whiskey, you're like, holy crap! Yeah, yeah, we were on we were in the Orkney Islands, must be about ten years ago now, and we were we were traveling with friends and. Um, I don't know if he's still doing it, but at, at the time, um, my friend John was an international rum judge. Oh, uh, oh, cool. He was always getting these, you know, couriered bottles of rum coming to the house, but we were traveling in Orkney and we went to the Highland Park distillery. And as it turns out, if you're tra traveling with someone who is a, uh, a, an international recognized, uh, drink judge of some kind, they can talk to the Highland Park people to say, Oh, oh, let me. And they they got out one of the twelve hundred dollar bottles. Mm. Oh, mm -hmm. a sample of that, and it's like, oh my gosh. Okay, this is really good. It's not twelve hundred dollars of good. Yeah, right. I understand why it's like Expect more than two hundred dollars. Yeah, good. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Yeah, oh, that's cool, man. Yeah, maybe for like a a wedding gift or for your bachelor party or something, Gabe, I'll I'll get you like a three hundred dollar bottle of whiskey or something. That'd be cool. <laughs> that would be cool. That would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I you know I've I've tasted a lot of the range and sort of my there are I have paid two hundred dollars for a bottle of whiskey and said, okay. This is actually, you know, that much better than the seventy dollar bottle. Yeah. Whiskey. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to do it very often, but I, right. I get it. Yeah. But any price point above that, I'm like the, it gets better, but incrementally not enough to justify the cost. But yeah. But I can occasionally justify the yeah, that yeah that I I I'm gonna pay this. I'm gonna yeah. It will hurt. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. It's worth it. Yeah, we had a. Uh... A few episodes ago, we had another booktuber on that we were just kind of chatting with, uh, Madison Goodyear, and she was saying she's really into wine, and she was saying that after you know after you get past like a hundred and fifty dollars or so or two hundred or so past past that for a bottle of wine, um, she's like she 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 says that she doesn't really notice a difference and that she had tried a uh like fifteen hundred dollar bottle of wine or something she's like it was good but i would never pay fifteen hundred dollars for it yeah <laughs> so yeah my mom my mom enjoys wine and she's i would i would call her a connoisseur she always has been mm -hmm. and you know sh she's had expensive wines in the house and stuff but her favorite of all time and like i said she's gone so many wine tastings she's been all all over the world doing it and mm -hmm. her favorite bottle of wine is a sixteen dollar bottle of wine the crown oh, she yeah. says it's the best white wine she's ever tasted <laughs> my wife's parents are in a similar place where they're like yeah we'll go you know they'll they'll go do the cinema valley thing and they'll try a bunch of really expensive wines and they're like yeah like no it's it's good but it's mm. it's <laughs> not incrementally better yeah. enough to bother. yeah right yeah could you imagine could you imagine that feeling if you put fifteen hundred dollars on a bottle and just like that final cup of it and it's like this is the end of like what I put on that <laughs> Oh man, that would feel so weird. I couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, that would feel yeah. weird. So you know, we have a my my wife and I have a tradition. We you know we're old enough that we've had a number of friends and family pass on over the years. So we will typically get a, a memorial bottle, mm. and and that's, and that's one of the that's one of the okay. The, this this cost justifies the fifty percent more than I would buy yes. for a re regular bottle, and then it's. You no, know, it's got the the dual purpose, and there's there's a right. The emotional note with the drink is very nice. Absolutely, that's, cool. that's a like great that. idea. I like that a lot. That was a great discussion about whiskey. I I love <laughs> I love talking about that. Um, let's talk about the uh, the Durkoth a little bit and some of the other races that we see uh, in this world. And one thing I really love about the am I pronouncing that right, Durkoth? Sure. 
I, okay. I don't I don't have a real strong attachment. <laughs> okay. Dirk Hawk, Dirk Hawk, it's I think the okay. I think the graphic audio people uh made it a yeah. harder. But harder I, I key, yeah. Yeah, for me it's a it's but it's it was Dirk Hawk, but I don't I don't get wound up in the pronunciation sure. of that. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh well yeah, I I love them just as like a race in this world. They're so alien and unlike anything um that i've seen in fantasy before and and even at the beginning of the second book we see them do just just have really interesting properties like uh errol touches one and he's like immediately aroused <laughs> like so like he's just like completely infatuated with this guy as soon as he touches him because there's something i, I mean you would know there's probably like some sort of like pheromone or something whatever it is mm -hmm. But um, yeah, what what kind of went into the creation of these guys? And do you want to talk about any of the other races that we see in the series? I, I guess without going into like super spoilers or anything, but if there's anything yeah, you can sure. chat about. So the so the Durkhoff, and again, this is you know I mentioned earlier, and in in, we were talking about my sort of shorthanding in my head. Mm -hmm. So in my in my shorthand in the outline, you know, the Durkhoff were essentially. Um, bog standard Tolkien dwarves. That was just that was the place they occupied in the the big nine book kind of discussion of 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 what they were the purpose they were going to serve. Mm -hmm. But then I you know when I one of the things that I love about writing novels is I'll write twenty pages on what the book is going to be. I do that less now because I at this point it's it's that process is more automatic in my head. But I used to be a pretty thorough outliner. Well, right. I'll write 20 pages about a book, and and that feels like, wow, you know, I I really know exactly what's going to happen. And then you get to it, and well, that 20 pages is going to turn into, you know, four or five, you know, four or five, six hundred. That leaves an enormous amount of blank space that is part of the discovery part of writing. So I I had, actually I was talking with my writers group at that point about book two. I we we were finishing up book one. And I said something about dwarves and 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 um, you know the Durkhoff fulfilling that space mm. in the story. And my friend Light is like, "Oh, dwarves are <laughs> man, you could do better than that. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen you do better than that. I don't want to hear anything about dwarves." And I'm like, <laughs> "Oh, they weren't really going to be dwarves, but now that you put it that way, I should probably pause and think about them a little more thoroughly." Yeah. Um, and so for me, part of the process of writing a book or a series or a story is I kind of have to know what the last thousand years of that world's history looks like, even though maybe none of that appears on the page. And so I'm like, OK, I'm not working in Tolkien's universe. I'm not writing dwarves. That was always the intent when I got there. But now I'm here. I need to think about it a little more thoroughly. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, okay, so I had a loose idea of how my world was organized and how the gods worked and and what historical antecedents. So like, you know, the the core of a lot of the earlier books is the city of Tien, which is loosely a first century Chinese city, but it's mm -hmm. it's very loosely that. It's got some of that. Um, it's got some stuff from Meiji Japan. It's it's the the monetary system is essentially uh late republican roman um mm -hmm. so i i have all of those things that i i want to put together because i want my world to not be our world i want right. i want people to be able to go to the world and say oh i can see hints of this and that but i want them foundationally i want my readers to like this is a new space this isn't first century china that's why i say it's a long yeah. line like that so I'm like, okay, so what are what are my other species? How did they get here? What's what's their their background? And so I sort of took some of the stuff that I had written in the in the earlier world stuff and 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 developed that out. And I said, okay, so these aren't they're actually nothing like dwarves. They are um part of this first people who were all one people. They're I mean, they're different. I don't want to say racially, but that's probably the closest analog. But, you know, my first people, my fae who bound with the element of Earth become my Durkhoff. Yeah. So what I was trying to do was essentially go, 
Okay, what do we think about when we think about classic, really deep fairy tales? Not the sort of the modern stuff, but the these are alien, dangerous, beautiful creatures. Yeah. Um, and how does that play out in the as they ally themselves with the different elements, which is part of the the world of the of the Blade books, with you know life, death, earth, fire, water, air, shadow, and light are my mm. my core elements. And how does that play out with each of the different groups of, of them? So that was that was what I was working towards with the Durkoth. And then I'm like, how do I make them not just be classic fairy tale plus this earth element? How do I how do I make them something entirely their own that that there isn't an antecedent for? And that's kind of how I I I work. I start with here's my shorthand. Okay. That's not where I'm going, but the shorthand gives me what do I need to think about in terms of some of 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 of, of history and what do I need to think about in terms of magic, and then how do I take that and and dial it to eleven? How do I get it to that next stage right. where it's it's entirely a a Kelly McCullough version of that and not right. just a generic you know dark she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and I think that's kind of what I loved about it is it, it felt so different than anything else I had read about. And really everything in this story feels different because I think that, you know, I've, I've read a lot of rogue fantasy and assassin fantasy stories and stuff. And um, after a while, you know, you, you get to some of them and they, they all kind of feel the same a little bit, you know, it's kind of a, a dark city with an underground you know, thief guild or an underground like assassin guild and stuff. And they're very cool, but eventually they all kind of become the same. The Fallen Blade series has always very much stood apart from that because there's just so many different elements with the uh, the companions and the way that magic is used kind of through the, the companion bond. Um, and then with things like the Durkoth, like I, I just love them so much. From the first time I saw, from the first time I saw them, I was like, "Man, these things are weird and awesome and different." Um, and I, I loved the whole like uh, how they they speak to the earth and like convince it to do certain things or like uh, you know ask it to do certain things, and it like obeys through that bond that that they have with it. Um, and so I love scenes like, I, I can't remember which book it's in. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure there's a scene where Errol gets taken through the earth by by one of the Durkoth, right? And there's this whole scene of like Errol kind of like in this bubble with earth all around him. He's being like taken through. Um, I always think scenes like that are are really, really cool. And then there's a scene later on and i think it's in the same book where we see the big uh wall city they they make like a raft that's on the earth right am i remembering this yeah. correctly and they're like on an earth and they're just flying through like the through the wasteland just like on this little carpet of um like sticks and grass and stuff and they're just like Phew! and the the Durkoth is like kind of propelling it through through his magic and i i just think that kind of stuff was so cool it's such a unique magic system for them that i had never seen before well thank you and yeah that's 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 pretty much exactly the scene that's it's, it's drawn blades um okay yeah and so one of the things and this isn't really a spoiler because it's um book seven which i'm I, which is i know it's out with some beta readers right now and i'll get a polished version soon mm -hmm. but one of the things i have in in book seven is we see the Veshan, and that's the the water version of 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 these alien peoples. Oh, okay. And one of the one of the moments, one of the beats that I love about it is Errol is is dealing with them, and he has this moment where he's like, "Oh, I just kind of until this moment thought of you as being underwater Durkoth, but mm. foundationally you're really really alien to your Earth cousins because." Oh you're allied with water and water is all about movement and freedom. And it's just an entirely different concept space and an entirely different elemental space. And all of the associations we have with, you know, sort of constant motion, which is incredibly um, alien to that Durkoth uh, moments of stasis because mm -hmm. the, 
one of the things I, I did with the Durkhoff to try and make them work is that they are like the Earth, they're static, but they move. So it's they move in this sort of the beats between you looking at them. Yeah, mm. that's right. I do remember that. Yeah, e even where uh, when he when Errol first meets the uh, the Durkhoff in book two, there's a, a cool moment where the I think the Durkhoff was like in the wall and Errol was like communicating with him. And the Durkhoff is just completely still, but communicating and Errol couldn't get a read on him because he's like, I don't know how to tell what this thing is thinking or feeling like he's so mm -hmm. like stone still. Well, one of the one of the one of the tools you have as a writer to make something alien mm -hmm. and you part of it is to the extent possible writing an alien. But one of the one of the best tools, especially if you're writing first person like Errol is that those moments of bafflement and oh my my you, you are so much more fucking alien than, <laughs> than I can you highlight it with their with their just dumbfoundedness about right. how this is nothing like what I was expecting. Yeah, yeah. It, it works really really well with the first person. So I have I have two more questions before we kind of I guess go into spoilers if we want to. One of them is about the uh, the audiobooks. I was wondering if there was any like, is there any specific story behind like the publisher doing the the one audiobook for the first book and then the rest of them in graphic audio? Is there any story there? Yeah, it's it fundamentally that's a story about uh, the way rights are sold for books in 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 our current market. Okay, so. Um, Penguin Random House licensed the right to audiobook when they bought the series from me. They did not license the right to essentially full audio plays. So one of them is a pure representation of the book, and the other one is a dramatic presentation. Right. And yeah. those are those are divided in 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 the industry into very different categories. Mm. Oh, okay. So, Penguin owns the right to, to do an audiobook. And at that point, uh, Tantor Media was trying to, you know, be a, a really good competitor to um, Audible. Uh, that has not, I think, gone particularly well for them. <laughs> but so they 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 bought the right to do the first book and a and a license to do the books after that. And I don't know whether that particular book didn't do very well for Tantor or whether Tantor didn't do very well at all, but them having that essentially worked as a, a blockade to selling the other ones, for example, to Audible. I think that license just lapsed, so it's possible that oh, okay. Penguin will be able to relicense them to Audible or depending how things go with my current agent and the, yeah. the new books that I'm writing them, I might end up with those rights back and then I might oh, cool. either my training actually is acting. I actually can do a pretty good version of my own audio. Oh, so cool. I might, if I get them back, I might do the audible program where authors do it, or I might see about relicensing them. But so that's, that is in, you know, kind of this weird space as I'm, as I'm getting rebuilt, but I owned at the time I owned the dramatic rights and when graphic audio, um, said hey would you be interested in this i'm like yeah absolutely oh cool. I, i'd love to see an audio version of these and i i'm really happy with their production i think they did a, a pretty good job there yeah. a couple you know we can always second guess bits and pieces there are like some script pieces where i'm like oh i might have done that a little bit differently but i'm i'm overall i'm really happy with the, with the jobs they've, they've done yeah. you know they didn't earn me an enormous amount of money it's not sure not that big a chunk of the of the market but i was really happy that there's an audio version out there and so people yeah. who are more interested in that have that that option yeah. and you know, maybe they'll pick up pick up the books as well but I, I i think they did a great job and i was really happy to to license to them but the difference is who owns the particular type of audio rights right mm -hmm. okay man that's that's interesting and it's exciting that you know if if the rights do go back into your hands or if podium picks it up um, it, it's exciting that things have uh, are kind of changing to where that that might be a possibility again because I I would love to see the rest of the books in like a like a 
uh, like an actual like audio book. Um, and, and the first one is really good. I really love Paul Bomer. Uh, yeah. He does the mm -hmm. Night Angel trilogy. Oh, yeah, it was a great job. It just I like I said I don't know what the exact balance was, but it it yeah. didn't make it money for them to be able to to sink in and do the next one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We we just read um, Night Angel Nemesis, and we loved the book, obviously, but the narrator they switched from paul bomer to simon vance and simon vance is great but i just i don't think he was like a great choice for that book but this week going back to uh to broken blade and hearing yeah. paul bomer again i was like it was oh, nice. i missed yeah, paul bomer. It was nice. <laughs> yeah no he did a great job i i yeah. you know, i let me let me be very clear i love the tantor book i think oh, they yeah. did a great job yeah. but just Speaking of Night Angel, have you, uh, have you, I'm sure you've read the Night Angel trilogy, I would assume, right? Uh, sadly, no. I, I, oh, it, anything for, you know, one of the funny things about being where you are in, in, in career is I don't actually read that much science fiction and fantasy anymore. Yeah, sure. I have this huge chunk of stuff that, that is the foundation of who I am and, uh, and, and my, my reading mm -hmm. and, and my writing. And I, I go back to some of those, but, at some point in the process, as you become a professional author, it becomes harder and harder to read within your genre for pleasure. Mm, so yeah, I'm much I more likely that. at this point to read uh, graphic novels, uh, mystery, thriller, yeah. um, historic. So I, I, I'm still reading a lot, but I'm not reading an enormous amount in inside the genre in part because it feels too much like work, even like though I work. Yeah. yeah, I could imagine. Yep. Yeah, that's like me. I I work in construction and I, I used to do all sorts of little projects on the weekends. I would like make a table or I would do some stuff around the house and like fix things. And now on the weekends, I'm like, I don't want to look at my tools. I don't want to have to do <laughs> anything like that because I do that Monday through Friday. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. I get that. <laughs> All right, so then last uh, last question before we go into some spoiler talk. Is there anything that you're working on now that you'd like to talk about? And you you mentioned, we, we've mentioned a couple times the, the Patreon with the seventh Fallen Blade book being written through that. So with your new agent, I forgot about that. With your new agent, will it be published? Uh, will they be getting that published through someone, or will you be self-publishing the seventh? So that's that's an open question. So when I was starting to, starting to look for a new agent, I wrote a completely new new book, new series, uh, pitching it around because that's it's just a lot easier to work that way. So what my new agent right now is pitching is the first book in a, in an actual trilogy trilogy, and it's called Hobbs Apprentice. And, you know, I, I, I'm not going to pitch it out to readers because I have no idea when or where it may appear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what he's doing right now. Um, once he's in the groove for that, we have we have a couple of other discussions. I've got a another trilogy, which is a alternate World War Two fantasy. And there are two books written in that. And that's, oh, that sounds cool. I like like it a lot. And a number of folks in my writers group are like, this is the best thing you've ever written. Why not? <laughs> nice. So that and what to do with the with the blade books is the next part of my my agent discussion. But I'm I'm letting, you know, we like I said, we just got the paperwork finally signed a month ago. So I'm gonna let that settle a little bit before we start having a conversation about and these are the five other projects that I'm working <laughs> on. But nice. Okay. Blade seven is complete and it is out with I don't know, I got about a dozen beta readers on this and I've got the first comments back and pretty soon I'll have a polished version. Once I have an actual polished version, then I'll say, Hey, uh, Bob, what do you want to do with this? Right. Do you want to try and sell this generally? Do you want to try and sell this to Penguin Ace? Do you the first six books and then reissue them all indie? Cause I've got a couple of indie titles as well. I had a, I had a trilogy, not a trilogy. I had three books that were all urban fantasies they were unrelated to each other but they kind of thematically similar that i think five times i i got pretty close to a deal on selling those and each time something happened like uh the editor who wanted to buy them quit one time the editor who wanted to buy them was fired one time oh. who was talking about buying them died uh marketing uh, it got all the way through P&Ls to marketing and then marketing. Says, ah, I don't think we can sell these. And there's a fifth and I can't remember, but I, I called them my cursed books. Yeah. And so I've been publishing those independently. The first two, Numismancer and Winter of Discontent, 
are, are available um, in ebook and hardcover. And the third one, I just need to find the time to uh, do the final cover approval and get the copy edits finished on that. So that's those are the indies. So whether the Blade books go on the indie pile or I've actually had a couple of small presses that are really interested in them. So that's probably probably more likely than the indie pile. Uh, mm-hmm. But I'm I'm not sure. That's that's like uh, August's conversation with Bob. Right. <laughs> Okay. So on the, I remember there, there was a period of time where if you signed up for your Patreon, you could read the, the chapters of the seventh book as they were put out. Is that still a thing or is that not, or is it? Oh, that's still there. Oh, um, oh, okay. I will some point real, once I get the, once the, once the beta is done, if you sign up for the Patreon, you'll be able to just like pop in and read the whole book. Oh, cool. um, but anyone who signs up can, you know, go back through the archives and they can read it chapter by chapter that way. Sweet. It's just there isn't a there isn't a single easy to get at version. Oh, but it is, okay. yeah. But if you sign up for the Patreon, you absolutely can just um, go back and I think there's a fairly easy way to look at things like on on the first of the month. And okay. so that it's all there. And then also the first, I think five chapters of book eight are up on the Patreon as well. Oh, cool. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's completely there in beta form and the beta form. So it's probably worth noting because it's, this varies wildly from author to author, but typically my beta version is really pretty close to the final version. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go back and and read it chapter by chapter, you'd be getting something that's probably 85% in tune with the, maybe 95% in tune with the beta. And that'll probably be 80 to 90 percent tune with the final version so there is a, right. a pretty close to polished version up chapter by chapter on the patreon very cool all right so yeah i guess let's uh let's pop into spoilers for a little bit before we before we head out of here we'll ask a couple spoilery questions um so viewers if you are you know hopping off the video right now to go read the series and come back for the spoiler chat thank you for watching um i obviously highly recommend the fallen blade series you've heard me talk about it a number of times uh on the podcast and in you know other little reviews that i've done um i did a top 10 favorite rogues video that i'll put up in the annotations somewhere wherever it comes up up there uh and that'll pop up so you can check that out errol is definitely in there so yeah please definitely check out the fallen blade series by kelly mccullough and we will be going in to spoiler talk uh well first gabe do you so gabe do you want to stay for spoiler talk or do you want to it's up to you i'll I'll stay you know me spoilers don't really bother me super bad yeah it's not going to ruin anything i still enjoy it as i go okay uh so yeah spoilers in three two one you've been warned (laughs) all right so Let's see. Uh, my my first question here is, you know, speaking of the the Patreon Fallen Blade novel, for those of us that have finished the the first six books, because I I got to the end of the sixth book and I was like, oh, this is like where the series ends. It feels like a very good kind of ending for everybody. They're kind of, uh, you know, they've they've come back to the island. And uh, Errol and his whole group of people that survived the the fall of the ten- temple, um, and, and I think some new people as well, if I remember correctly. Um, <laughs> and they're all on the island, and they're kind of reinvigorating the spirit of what this place was, and kind of trying to. It, it kind of ends in a way that made it seem like they are trying to figure out what they want the temple to be now and what they want to do going forward. And, uh, you know, Errol is basically thinking about training all these people and bringing in a new generation of uh, assassin or blades. And so I'm curious when we, as we go into the seventh book, what what's kind of like the back of the book thing? Like no, no like major spoilers, but what do we see kind of going into book seven? Okay, so... Um... Like I said earlier uh, in, in the in the discussion, I had kind of laid out nine books um, somewhere around the middle of book one, and I had, at that point I had the first four I think pretty pretty sound, but I had a, a a sense of where I wanted to go. So when we got to book six, it was it was right in the middle of the Penguin Random House merger, and that was um, 
very disruptive for those of us who, who were at, at Penguin. I, my editor and I were like, we want to leave. We don't know that we're going to be able to come back to the series. We, right. we want to leave readers in a really good place so that they can Thank get you. to the book <laughs> and say, okay, everything's going to be okay. <laughs> and so that was, we, I added an epilogue that was not originally attached to the book. So there's that, that very last chapter is, is specifically to lay out, this is where ultimately where the story is going to kind of end. It's not completely where it ends, but it's, it's a pretty good representation of, of, of the end point of book nine for that matter. Although there's, there's some more to go on. So book seven uh, takes up immediately from the penultimate chapter of book six and goes through, uh, I think, I think the end of book eight, which is what I'm working on right now is about where that, final chapter of book six actually plays out in the story so book seven oh. and book eight are the stuff that happens between okay the 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 son of heaven is dead um that's going to have all kinds of huge implications we're rebuilding so between those two things a bunch of stuff happens and it's mentioned in passing in that epilogue and so book seven and book eight are all the things that happen off screen between those chapters Oh, okay. So, so is the end of so is the end of book six then kind of the end of of book nine, or will we see more stuff after that that epilogue? The of book, so the end of book six is actually basically the end of book eight. Oh, okay, cool. So nine happens entirely after that end of book six. Okay, um, and wraps up a bunch of threads that I've been I've been trying to lay the clues and and all of the bits down for book nine throughout the whole you know set of the first six books so so book nine and again my okay so let this i don't think i mentioned this before so one of my kind of core values as a science fiction and fantasy author is most of my readers would like to end uh, the journey the story journey in a place where they're like yeah things are going to keep happening but basically at least for the moment, everything is going to be all right. That's where I want to leave you. I want you to, to, to get to the end of the arc and be like, wow, that was cool. Some shit happened that I wasn't expecting. But I, I'm kind of feeling like everything's going to be all right. So that's, yeah. that's, that's kind of where I'm going to leave you at the end of book nine, too. But there's right. a lot of stuff that will happen after that end of book six in book nine. But book seven and eight are a lot of stuff happening between those last two chapters of book six okay that's that's really cool i like that i like that a lot kind of filling in filling in the blank there do the do the books get bigger like i have uh this is the omnibus but um do the do the books get bigger in seven and eight like or do they stay the same size I uh seven is definitely bigger so my sort of my natural tar so with 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 the with the web mage books they were like eighty five thousand words with the blade books I was shooting right around ninety thousand, but they came in at about a hundred. Uh, book seven is, I think, one hundred and twenty, one hundred and thirty. So it is, it is closer to that big fat fantasy in length. Okay. Um, in part because I'm I'm dealing with two cultures you haven't seen at all in the in the first books, mm -hmm. and and this isn't a huge spoiler, uh, but I, I get a give you a pretty good look at at the Vashan, which are my they're not mer people, but they're mer right. people. Right, right, right. The shorthand is is they're mer people. So I give you a good big chunk of their culture, and there is they're as far away from mer, mer people as the Durkoth are from from dwarves. But that, right. and then Kanjuri, the islands off the northeast coast there that you see in in the map, and much of the action takes place there. Okay, cool. What, what what's it called, Kanjuri? Kanjuri, yeah. Um, the omnibus. Yeah, if you remember uh, the Kitsune, the the oh yeah, with the nine-tailed fox. Oh yeah, I see. Yep, yep. Okay, cool. So book seven is is the Veshan and Kanjuri, um, and this is kind of the way I think of them because, like I said, I'm I'm a world-driven writer. Okay. Uh, book eight is um, Kadesh a little bit, and Avon and Os and White Fang Mountain and Raidwald, that, that northern tier that you haven't seen anything of in the previous books. Okay, nice. I wanted to say, 
uh, it's it's not really a question or anything, but just something that I really appreciate about the series is, you know, a lot of times in assassin books like uh, Night Angel or uh, Shadow Sun or or actually Shadow Sun is actually more probably more on the Fallen Blade side. But in, in a lot of like roguish fantasy books, there's a lot of like rooftop running and you know crashing through a window and dagger in the heart and like that kind of like high action stuff and i i like that like that's why you know that's why one of the reasons why i love assassin fantasy yeah. but one of the things i really appreciate about the the fallen blade series and probably one of my favorite scenes in the whole series comes from the first book and it is the flashback to Errol killing ashvik mm. and just this slow process over the course of what was it a, a week or something where he's like yeah, like, so like gain, a week or two. yeah like gaining intel and he's sitting in like a hammock underneath uh like a, a balcony area and he's got to do the thing with the mage bl- mage blind and the the corner bright and kind of mm-hmm. like re- redirecting the the spell that is is shining in a certain area and i just love that like super slow process of him just like painfully slowly like creeping through the castle like taking taking care on on each step to make sure that he doesn't exhale at the wrong time or the stone dog will see him or whatever you know like there, mm-hmm. there's so many moments and it makes you feel the tension so much when because you know any of us who yeah uh, you know we're teenagers living at home with our parents know the feeling of getting up at one in the morning and you you know what step what what part of the stair to step on so that yeah. it doesn't creak and just that very slow like going down to the refrigerator or you know going down to like turn on your xbox after hours <laughs> um and just just that feeling and so i i love i love that in the fallen blade series because um th- there is those moments where you know he jumps off a building and and tris spins wings a shadow and he soars down from the sky and like these high action moments but then there's these moments where he's like i literally cannot move otherwise i will be seen uh in these long periods of like intel gathering and stuff um and i i love that so so much because it's something that you don't you don't really see very often in in fantasy i think the the closest thing that's probably gotten to it is uh the liza lock lamora um, and he doesn't do a whole lot of like sneaking in that series, but he does a lot of like behind the scenes, like Intel gathering before he does like his big thing. Um, and so anyway, again, not a question. I just really love that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Mhm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I I also love it, within that too. I love how if I remember correctly, it's happened a few times in the series, but specifically the first book, because that's the one I just read, was where he'll time something. He'll go one, and then my hand in the handhold, and two, my hand up on the parapet, three, a launch with my legs. And he's like going through like step by step. I find that so fascinating. I just love, I, is that, that, that was kind of another another thing I was thinking about is that a hard thing to write as far as when you're writing this um, kind of like parkour and uh, action scenes where it's really specific, like you have to have a clear image of where the enemies are in relation to Errol and where his movement is taking him. Is that hard to write and like keep track of in your head as, as you're kind of writing it down? Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. 
Cool. Okay. Nice. Right. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's cool. cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I, I bet that I bet that comes in handy. It sounds like you have a lot of like, uh, just from like your own experiences and stuff. It sounds like you have a lot of spatial awareness anyways. And so bring that to the page. It, it definitely comes through because there's some like really complex, complex things that he does in the Fallen Blade series where it's like, wow, and it, it you write it in a way where it's not it's not hard for the reader to track it but it is a lot that's like going on that's like very complex and so i'm like man that that must be that must be hard to uh to envision sometimes but that's really cool that you have you have training in that another question i have and forgive me this may have been answered in the books i can't remember but do we know how old tris is cuz he's he he wasn't born when he was given to errol right he had been living in the Everdark? Is that Everdark? Yeah, is Everdark. Right there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> mm. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh cool. there we go cool <laughs> and then speaking of familiars and stuff uh the dyad in the second book mentions that vampires are real in this world and can be companions uh like tris is to uh errol or at least that's what i understood what what she was saying um is there do, are we going to see vampires first of all? Uh, or what are some of the other like magic familiars that maybe we haven't seen yet? If you can talk about them. Mm. Yeah. Oh, oh cool. Okay, cool. Well, <laughs> 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 it's wild. Okay. Yeah.
Yeah. Okay, nice. I I really like the uh I first of all, I love Bon Trang, the the little cat griffin yeah. thing. Um and then also uh the I can't remember exactly what they're called, but the clouds, the little cloud familiars. I love those. And those those are the familiars of the like the um Yeah, Hands of Heaven, yeah. Um Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Those were really cool. I always love just kind of like picturing this little cloud, just kind of like bobbing around next to him. <laughs> All right. We got uh, a couple more quick ones that we'll go through. One thing I really wanted to know. And uh, forgive me, because I can't quite remember. Errol, Errol kind of ends up with, uh, in, in that epilogue, he's, he ends up with Jax in a lot of ways, right? Or, or is it Sir Siri? Or... Vague. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, I I'm just gonna say I really hope that it's Maylene. I <laughs> I love Maylene so much. I think it's so cool having this uh nobility that had some time as like a rover and she was kind of like on the road for a long time so she's got kind of this um i don't know almost kind of like roguish farm girl kind of side to her and but also like the high nobility um and so i always kind of liked that that interplay between the two but i love her character so much and i thought her and errol were really great together <laughs> <laughs> mm. Nice. Okay, cool. Okay, so I guess two more quick ones. Last two are, are there any other cool parts of the world or other gods and their followers that you would like to explore before the series ends? Um, and I, I can't remember which, all, all, all of which gods we saw in the, the first six books, because we obviously, you know, we see flashbacks and whatnot to Namera. Uh, we see some stuff with the the hands of heaven, and then we we get the Durkoth, but I can't quite remember. They they do have like a god that gives them their magic, right? Or is it just the earth? Right. Right. That's right. Yes, I remember this. Okay. Okay. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I 
I totally forgot about the uh, the Durkoth gods that are buried underground. I remember being, I'm a little fuzzy on the details, but I remember being so fascinated by that and just that whole storyline. <laughs> Yeah, right. Cool. cool. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. So I guess we'll kind of end with what was your favorite scene to write or favorite uh, plot point that you got to explore in like the later books? Like, oh, I've been waiting, you know, four books to get to this or I've been waiting five books to get to this or whatever. Hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Nice. Nice. <laughs> right. Right. Mm. Right, right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, that that is such a good point. I I love any of the scenes um where Nemera just kind of like there there's a magical intervention, let's say. There's like a divine intervention and there's you you even see it at the uh at the end of the first book when he kills Sumi and he takes Devin's blade and Devin's like that's not going to work. Like that that blade won't work for you. And Errol's just kind of like, but I believe in justice. And like, I believe that what Namera was doing was for the betterment of everyone. And that like level of faith, that level of belief in, in what he's doing being right. It's almost like Namera is a goddess, but like justice is like the god overall of that. And it's like he not only does he have faith in the mayor, but he has faith in like justice and he's totally bent on that. And, uh, and then that's when we see uh, Sumi, Sumi die from, from the blade. I would say that one of my favorite plot points to get to in the series, um, I think there's, there's three. The first one is, um, and this is one thing I don't want to spoil for Gabe, 
but there is a certain master that we see uh, in one of the next couple books. And, and that moment uh, just blew my mind so hard when I got to it. I was like, what? That's so cool. Um, and then the other one is uh, Errol going and retrieving his blades. That is such a fantastic moment in the story that I love so much. Um, and then the uh, the killing of the son of heaven. And I'm trying to remember if if you could remind me exactly how he does it, because I can't remember how it all played out. But I remember when I read that, I was like, that was awesome. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mm. Nice. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. Well, yeah, I think, uh, you know, those were, uh, those were some of my favorite points in the series. There's a million more that I could mention. Um, like I loved, I loved all their like conversations and all the things that just kind of happened on the, on the ship while they're traveling from, from place to place with, with his apprentices, all those little moments with, uh, God, I feel like such a bad fan. I can't remember his apprentice's name. <laughs> For on. Um, yeah, all those little moments with her. I I just I love I love this series so much. Thank you so much for writing it. It's like like I said, it's been such a huge part of my life. And I I really appreciate you coming on just to hang out and talk about it. It's been great. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, cool. Oh, that'll be interesting. <laughs> that'll be fun. All right, man. Well, we're going to get out of here. We've probably kept you a little bit longer than I had uh, initially anticipated keeping you, but thank you for, <laughs> yeah, thanks for hanging out and uh, just kind of chilling with us and talking about this wonderful series. Is there anywhere people can follow you besides Twitter? Do you have a website or anything you want to plug? Okay. Pick up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Well, that is going to wrap us up there, guys. You can keep up with Kelly McCullough by following his Twitter linked in the description, as well as all his other stuff, all of that linked down below. Uh, down there, you can also find our Twitter, Discord, and Patreon links if you feel so inclined to follow us on any of those. And don't forget that subscribing and liking is the best way to support the channel. So please do so if you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it. Uh, depending on when this goes up, our upcoming episode should be our next Into the Cosmere discussion. I think that's what we have lined up next, uh, where we'll be doing a spoiler deep dive on Elantris by Brandon Sanderson. So stay tuned for that. And over on the second channel, we're putting out discussion episodes for the show Yellow Jackets on Showtime. Uh, if that interests you, over there we talk about movies, shows, and video games. Uh, that's linked in the description as well. It's called Fantasy Files Reacts. Um, so yeah, as always, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, the Emperor of Heaven may have killed Namara.
but you can never kill justice. Mm. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. And a big shout out to our first Night Angel tier patron, Shad Zaman. Thank you so much, man.